Okay, today we're looking at what I currently consider the best bang for your buck 5 inch on camera monitor for budget video production out there. I will start with what I like about it, move on to what I don't like about it, then show you the assist features and end up with my opinion. Now the number one reason I was interested in this monitor was the recording to SD card feature. Now both my main cameras have two fast slots and dual or simultaneous recording options. But for events and sports, I always still wanted to run them all the time, so I didn't miss a single shot for not powering up or hitting record quickly enough. With a large enough SSD, I could realize that with the Ninja V, but the amount of data was just choking me in post. I wanted the highest quality recording with a redundant recording of the same quality in camera by the push of the rec button, but a constant recording off camera with at least say a decent quality, but a low, a much lower data rate. Now this monitor gives me exactly that, and it's awesome. I shot a basketball game and the thing just kept running, recording really nice quality Full HD 50p all the time. So even when the home team was on the other side of the court and I didn't record max quality inside the camera, I still had footage in real nice Full HD. Also, the recorded Full HD is basically a downsampled version of 4K that is fed into the monitor from the camera. So it is super crisp. The next important thing is the quality of the panel itself. It is sharp, color accurate and very bright if you need it to be. I usually keep it at 50%. In the sun I will go to 100 and it works. The touch is precise, accurate and responsive. And works even if the panel gets pretty hot after a while. Speaking of heat. This monitor has active cooling. Two small fans are running to manage the heat the panel and the processing create. Even at full blast, they are close to silent. Not completely silent, but pretty damn quiet. All right, and this is almost touching the monitor again, right in front of the fans. So even if the camera is this close to you and for whatever reason the monitor would still face you with its back, it's not really an audio issue. These fans even at max speed are really, really quiet. You can choose between auto, low, off and high when it comes to fan speed. The build quality of this unit is really high as well. Complete aluminium build as far as housing is concerned, not plasticky at all anywhere. The design is excellent, really great ratio of screen size to unit size. And every in and output, every thread, the SD card slot, the headphone jack, all of that is precisely machined. You can really feel the quality plugging cables in or out. It is an HDMI only monitor, but it does have an HDMI out, so you can send the signal to another monitor, a wireless transmission system, or a streaming setup, which is pretty cool because I do all of this. Power is important. Without it, no video is being shot. This monitor has three power options, DC and Sony NPF on the back. Now I'm getting decent runtime off of one of those Sony NPF 750 batteries, which I think is the perfect size battery for such a monitor. Around 100 minutes of rec time with roughly 140 minutes of on time. So if you were to use it just as a monitor, I'm sure you would get maybe close to three hours out of it. At 50% brightness, that is. I also appreciate the 120 second power off warning in case of an empty battery. The screen is easily lockable via a touch command on the left side of the screen. Coming in at only about 283 grams without the battery, this thing is also pretty lightweight. Also an H9 glass protector comes with the unit. So you have to put it on yourself, but you don't need to buy one. Thanks, much appreciated. Now my main gripe is that it froze up on me once during recording. And I have not been able to reproduce that error, which kind of irritates me a little to be honest. But I guess it was just a glitch. I have recorded a ton with the monitor and it only did that once. Might even have been some kind of power fluctuation not even related to the monitor at all, but I don't know. Other than that one time though, it has performed like a champ wherever I took it. Also, there is, at least as of now, no cage option for this monitor, which means I don't get to use my beloved HDMI cable clamps, which to me is suboptimal, but it's not a deal breaker. Also, I found that not all of my Sony third-party NPF batteries fit the battery plate on the back perfectly. Some just don't click and lock when I put them in. Most do. 
The SD card that the monitor uses needs to be formatted FAT32. That means you are limited in file size for longer recordings, meaning you will get more than one file per long recording, I believe every 20 minutes with the highest data rate. Another thing with FAT32, it is not the format SD cards inside cameras use. This means you cannot switch SD cards between camera and monitor, which means you will have to have dedicated SD cards for this monitor. Then again, UHS-1 Class 10 SD cards are fast enough for the highest data rates this monitor offers. And a 64 gigabyte card, which will hold with the highest quality setting somewhere around six hours is really, really cheap. So even the dedicated cards will not break the bank. The playback is a bit slow to load and jump, but overall works well. Something that I don't quite appreciate is the fact that once you start to record on the monitor, you cannot enter the menu. The only features that still work are the ones you assigned to the function buttons on the top of the monitor. Also, there is no way to navigate the menu except touch. Also, you better have small to medium sized hands and fingers because the menu items sometimes are pretty small. Really, really small. So that could be a problem if you have large hands. So there are semi-positive to negative points to mention, but overall still a great monitor. Let's check out the menu and the feature set because it's plentiful. All right, let's breeze through this. Left in the middle, tap to lock, tap to unlock. Top left corner, resolution and frames per second. Right here, the item that shows you that an SD card is inserted, battery status indicator, red button, audio levels, menus. Menu number one, scopes menu, waveform or RGB panel, histogram, vector scope, opacity via touch and drag from zero to 100, or you could touch left to lower the opacity in 1% increments or to raise it in 1% increments. Next menu, marker menu, safe area. You can turn all of these on or off, select a color, select a width, and in this case, select a preset as a ratio, 80, 85, 90, 93, or 96. Grip, which really should be grid, let's turn that on. A two by two, three by three, or four by four, whatever floats your boat. Anamorphic D-squeeze, 2x, 1.8x, the often missing 1.65x, 1.5x, 1.33. So everything you really would need. Now there's a marker, obviously. Um, again, we can select the color. We can select a width, a preset ratio, and we can even enter a custom ratio down here. It's a bit fiddly, but it works. Center marker, on or off, color and width. Transparency for the mat, if the marker is turned on, 0, 50, 100. 50 is probably good. And that's the marker menu. Focus menu, peaking, you can turn it on or off, select the color and select the intensity. Zoom, once that is turned on, number one, the matte leaves, and you can go like this. Let's turn it off for now. Exposure menu, zebras, you can turn them on or off, set a maximum and a minimum threshold. We got false color, we got monochrome, red, green, blue, and grayscale. Color menu, now my FX3 already outputs the LUT information. If you use a camera that doesn't do that, you can turn the LUT on and you can select one from the SD card. These are pre-installed, or from the monitor, I should say. These are pre-installed, but you can also install your own, which is great for phantom LUTs, for example. You would do that via the custom import LUT function. You could also delete the LUTs later on. Gamma curve, now it offers 2.2, two, 2.4, and 2.6. If you want to have consistency throughout your monitoring, you can adjust this monitor to the gamma of another monitor that might not be adjustable. HDR, we got PQ and HLG, color temperature, user setting, 
5600K base, 6500K base. Then rec and playback menu, mode, user means, you have to touch the rec button and touch it again to stop. Trigger is an HDMI trigger, should your camera support that. Timecode is camera timecode, really, if your camera supports that. Recording definition, LT, HQ, XQ. Here's an overlay showing you the data rates and the file sizes for a one minute recording base. Down here, file naming, ZO or ZO is fixed. Then you can select an abbreviation or a letter really for the camera, an abbreviation, three letters for the scene, and then it's just gonna count up from one. So camera, scene, take. Playback, you can select the video files that are currently on the SD card, but I'm gonna do that from the playback menu. Now, settings menu, display, brightness, contrast, saturation, sharpness, RGB adjustments, gain and offset, so everything you need to calibrate your display exactly the way you like it. Settings, normal or underscan, backlight currently at zero. Obviously we can go much higher, like to 100%, but then you can't read the menus. So I'm going back to zero. Volume for the headphone output, fan mode, auto, off, low and high. Let's go to auto. SD card format option, because it uses FAT32, you need to format SD cards. And once they're formatted FAT32, you cannot use them in camera because the camera uses a different format. Anything from 23, anything from 32 to 512 gigabytes works. Function, function buttons on the top of the monitor, F1, F2, and F3. Here you can select or rather assign the function you want the function button to have. Individually for F1 through to F3. System, language, well, English or Chinese, I'm going with English. Version information, software update, also works via the SD card. Factory reset option and a little about us page. Then last menu, playback menu. It is a little slow to load. There we go. It's gonna auto play. You can hit pause, hit play, or go through the list of recordings. Bottom right corner, list of all the recordings currently on the SD card. Bottom left corner, come back to main screen. And that's it. Pretty complete feature set. Baseline, I like working with it. And that's the most important thing to me when it comes to gear. There are some quirks that do rub me the wrong way when it comes to recording and usability, but overall, as a tool for video production on a budget, as a monitor and as, let's say, a redundant proxy recording device, it's awesome. And for 240 bucks, it's a bargain, considering the build quality, feature set and panel. Taking it out of the box, I expected this thing to sit like right under 400. 240 is a steal. There is the option of firmware updates, of course, so close to everything I addressed on the con side when it came to usability or recording can be corrected in software, I assume. Hands down, for 240, this is the best monitor I've ever seen. Currently, I don't know of any other monitor that has a better bang for your buck ratio. Shimball, just release a firmware update. Someone, please create a cage that I can use my cable clamps. And then this thing is absolutely bonkers value for the money. Never heard of Shimball, but they do more products like this, I will keep them in the back of my head. I am impressed. Okay, so if you liked the video, if you found it helpful, please make sure to leave a thumbs up, it's greatly appreciated. Any kind of comment or feedback is welcome and I'll try to answer as quickly as possible. All the tech I've used in the video is linked in the description. As always, thank you so much for your time, thank you for watching and hopefully see you again soon.